This morning I felt it was important to really go back to basics again. I spoke on the Lordship of Jesus Christ the last time I spoke. And this morning I wasn't sure again what to do. I kept on it praying and asking. And then even this morning as we were upstairs at Mass, I believe that what Father John spoke about was a confirmation of what I wanted to do this morning. And, and, and that is, is, again, to go back to what are we here for? What do we believe? What's going on? Have we, how's our first love going with the Lord? Then forget that uh, this might sound very harsh, but what Jesus said to the church, which is in, um, in Revelation, was... You've lost, if you, 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 you've, lost, you've lost your first love. You're neither hot nor cold. Now that's easy to say and that's easy. You can throw that around and, you know, in, 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 in an unkind way. But, but the reality is it happens to all of us. It happens in other things as well, not only with Jesus. It could be marriage. We could have... Uh, Entered into it with great expectations, but after a few years, those expectations get very soured. So to maintain our first love, we have to understand. That's why we keep going back to Jesus as Lord. We keep going back to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We go coming back to worship, to spend that time, but to make that decision. Initially, when we first came, that first love if you like, the first love helped us. It was easy because we were so much in love with Jesus. Like we are when we first meet someone, we're so much in love. We'd do anything for that person. Give it a few years down the track. We may not feel like doing it, but we still do it because we should do it. And that's where the decision comes in. And that's why we've got to get ourselves out of the slumber. And that was good this morning because that's exactly what happened. We, you know, it's it's not easy, but we've got to keep at it. And we, we, you know, we want to see miracles again. We do see them from time to time. We're going to be keep praying for uh, Nancy, was it? Yeah. It'd be good if everyone can keep praying between now and tomorrow morning. Again, so that it's not just we come to a meeting, and, but we we want to have that that vision. Of coin and ear, that vision of, of, of you know, get life in God is something that's 24 hours a day, that we live it all the time. So, our first love has to come back to making Jesus Lord again. Because the reality is, as life goes on, Jesus does not remain Lord. And I'll give you little examples. For example, we may want something, we want it so bad, that we allow that to possess us rather than submitting that thing to the Lord. And then, you know, we say, we say well, we're all okay, but we won't surrender that thing, whatever it might be. A child, a, a job promotion, whatever it might be. Is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus, does Jesus take the priority in my major, particularly decision making? Do I submit whatever, I, what, what I want to him? Now, God may very well give you what you want, and most of the time he does, but is it submitted to him? Or do we still keep that thing that we, we just want, but we don't care what the Lord thinks? Secondly, that we don't forget the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Recently, we've had a couple of young people who have been baptised in the Holy Spirit. That's great because it revitalises. It revitalises our spiritual life. We want to see that baptism of the Holy Spirit continue. And have we lost our desire to worship him, to come here on Sunday and worship? Have we lost that? Obviously not for most of you because you're here and you're doing it. But 
There has been since the beginning of COVID, and that's why I read that prophecy that's on our fridge, our fridge at home, because I think it's very important, and I don't forget it. Today I felt like bringing it here and reading it. It was given at the end of 2019. And there has been a change between that time and, and recently in the way church generally is being conducted. And uh, we don't want to fall short. Again, our comparison is not with everyone else, but our comparison is with the Word of God. And the second thing is, worship, is, is fellowship. Fellowship means that we're in the light. But it means also making time to be together and by spending the, particularly that, that time out here between the two services is very, very important. Uh, it's fellowship. But more importantly is, is attending our groups. We've been very slack over the last 18 months. That's just the reality of it. There are good reasons, but we... We've become very slack, whether it's a group or cluster prayer or whatever. And God wants us, these are the things that, you know, when we read what happened to the early church, after, G, after Peter got up there, after Pentecost, he got up in front of the people and he gave them the kerygma. He gave them the kerygma. The kerygma, what's the kerygma? The kerygma is that Jesus died for your sin that he rose again on the third day, and that then he ascended into heaven, okay, 40 days later, and that he sits at the right hand of the Father, making constant intercession for us, and that then he sent the Holy Spirit. That's the kerygma. That's what we're saved and stand on. We don't stand on our own ability or our own righteousness, even on our own willpower. But we stand on that fact. And in that kerygma, we have a life. But again, it gets obscured. Initially, it's not obscured. So Peter gets up after Pentecost and he basically preaches that and he challenges the people to repent. And many of them had at least um, in a... Well, you know, how most of us, I suppose, behave to, to events. They, they just let it go. It was too hard, so they just didn't really bother about Jesus. He got crucified and killed by the leaders and the Romans. And many of the people sort of just went along with it. But as, as Peter preached, they were convicted by the Holy Spirit. And they said, what, shall we, what, what, what do we need? He said, repent and be baptised. Repent and be baptised. And then he goes on in Acts, at the beginning of Acts, after the day of Pentecost, he goes on and he says some things. He talks, he starts quoting the Old Testament. He starts quoting David. He starts quoting uh, the prophets. And he starts to uh, bring into focus, Jesus Christ. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God, by the miracles and portents and signs that God worked through him when he was among you, as all you all, you all know. This man who was put into your power by deliberate intention and foreknowledge of God, you took and crucified by men outside the law, that is, by the Romans. You killed him but raised him but God raised him to life, freeing him from the pangs of Hades or death. For it was impossible for him to be held in its power, since as David said of him, I saw the Lord before me always, for with him at my right hand nothing can shake me. So my heart was glad and my tongue cried out with joy. My body too will rest in the hope that you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to experience corruption. You have made known the way of life to me. You will fill me with gladness through your presence. Brothers, no one can deny 
that the patriarch David himself is dead and buried. His tomb is still with us. But since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn him an oath to make one of his descendants succeed on the throne, what he foresaw and spoke among, us, among was the resurrection of the Christ. He is the one who was not abandoned to Hades and whose body did not experience corruption. God raised him, God raised this man, Jesus, to life. And all of us are witnesses to that. Now raised to the heights by God's right hand, he has received from the Father the Holy Spirit who was promised and you see and hear is what, what you see and hear is the outpouring of the Spirit. For David himself never went up to heaven and yet these words are his. The Lord said, My Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you. For this reason, the whole house of Israel can be certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you could have survived, both Lord and Christ. So Jesus was proclaimed not only as Messiah, that word Christ means Messiah, he was not only claimed as Messiah, but he was proclaimed as Lord as well. So Peter tells the people, now this is the fact, in all that's been going on around Jerusalem at this time, in all that's happened, at the, during this sequence of Passover, what was going on? You, you were part of it. But God himself preordained this. It was part of God's plan to send his son. Now, this is a difficult thing for us as humans to understand. God's predetermined will and, and free will, which has also always been something that's been heavily debated. But the people had to accept their responsibility. And what the people did, they repented. What shall we do? What, what's, what's the response, they said? He said, repent. Repent. Acknowledge you've made a mistake. Acknowledge that wrong was done to, the, to, the, to this man who was the son of God, who was raised from the dead. Now, if you take a few moments... You go for all the Easter ceremonies. You go for Easter. You might have a bit of doubt. Is this all true? Did, did this really happen? Was Jesus, there's no doubt that Jesus was a historical figure, but was he truly raised from the dead? There's no one else in history, by the way, that's claimed to be raised from the dead. That's not your normal thing, is it? It's not something that happens every day. In fact, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but was he raised from the dead? Now, this is where faith comes in. This is where we believe, not through just intellectual understanding, as was told to us this morning, but because something happened to us. There was some enlightenment that happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, recently, I just received a, um, a, a eulogy of, um, uh, from Al Ralph Martin on the American Steve Clark, who was one of the... These two were founders of Covenant Community. And, and Ralph gave a eulogy at Steve's um, funeral. And uh, there were many things he said. One of the things he said, people, people were being baptised in the Holy Spirit everywhere, in the dormitories, in the streets in houses, in the basement of churches. And to some degree, I experienced a more moderate version of that in the 70s, when people would come along to meetings and they would get touched by God. We didn't have to do much at all, really. God did it. People were baptised. They were enlightened. They were able to say, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, risen, truly risen. Not because there were some great arguments or uh, some great exposition of the Bible, but that was by conviction, by conviction of God, by, the, by the, the sheer enlightenment of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, 
that's a special time in history. There was a lot of confusion going on around that time. A lot. The 60s. There was a lot of change going on in the world. And in some ways, we're actually in a similar time now. Very similar time. And so it's time again to preach the gospel. It's time again to preach the kerygma. It's time again to believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time again to get into worship and fellowship and not to be slack about it. As we were in those days, we could... Where's, where's Mike McGrill? There he is. He, we he couldn't wait to get to the Tuesday night meeting. Could you? Couldn't wait. I wonder how we are today. I know that there are good reasons at times, but I don't think that's the case today. Couldn't wait. People couldn't wait to the next meeting because there was such an anointing of the Holy Spirit that it, it, was, it, was, it was easy. It was desirable. I guess uh, the group of people, we were reasonably young, we were pretty broken a lot, except for Michael and Julie. <laughs> but, we lo- we, we, but we had time and we loved God. We did. Our Christian was also put together somewhat too. <laughs> there were a few others, a few people. But a lot of us were not. That didn't matter. Because God's in the business of restoring people. In fact, it's actually better that way because God gets the credit rather than man. So it doesn't matter how much we're put together or not put together. The important thing is that we all loved God because we're all responding to him. And the things that breaks my heart is to see people... uh, uh, What's the word? There's a word for it. I can't think of it because I'm getting older now. Um, uh, We we, we lose it. You know, you don't lose anything overnight. You lose it by making small decisions. So marriages crack up not because some, usually some major event, but usually because there's a lot of little decisions and attitudes that prevail for a number of years and then it explodes into something. That shouldn't happen. That's the same with our relationship with God. It's very important we keep at it. We keep worshipping God. Look, I don't feel like worshipping God. Uh, uh, Even uh, to prepare for this talk, I found it very hard. It was an effort. I had to put myself in the room to pray a number of times over the last two days. I didn't feel like it. I didn't feel anything. But I was determined to do it because I know that's what God wants of me at this time. So the same thing happened, first of all, to the people, uh, the people, to the people at Pentecost, which is coming up soon. The people were assembled. There was change. Then what happened after the change? Okay, we go to verse thirty-seven. Hearing this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, What must we do, brothers? You must repent, Peter answered, and every one of you must be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise that was made for you and your children, and all of those who are far away, for all those who whom the Lord our God will call to himself. He spoke to them for a long time using many arguments and he urged them, save yourself from this perverse generation. They were convinced by his arguments and they accepted what he said and were baptised. That very day, about 3,000 were added to their number. So here we have the, uh, the result of the kerygma, the result of preaching the gospel. Now, it's important that we continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that 
the preaching of the gospel in everyday life demands wisdom. Right? If you're preaching to someone in the street, you don't need wisdom. You just give them the message. But when you live with someone, or when someone's a family member, or someone that you work with, you've got to be able to have wisdom. Firstly, you've got to show by the way you live because they're watching you all the time. And so if you're going to say something but you're living the opposite, they're not going to take any notice of you by and large unless the Holy Spirit has some miraculous work to do and sees that person's heart. We have to exercise wisdom. So when we talk about preaching the gospel, it's firstly about allowing the gospel to take root in our own lives so that there's something to see that's a little bit different at least. And secondly then, to preach and speak out at the appropriate time when you are led by the Holy Spirit. Now there are times, as I said, where that uh, you don't have to be too concerned about that because you only see a person once. And they don't know that you get angry in the morning or anything like that, so you can just tell them how it is. Uh, they'll never see you again. But generally speaking, we've got to be able to communicate the gospel in a way that people can culturally accept it and also that they can see in us something of what we're preaching. So the result of all that was we had the, uh, the other reading from Acts chapter 4 this morning, but Acts chapter 2 says this was the result of it. They remained faithful to the apostles, to the teaching of the apostles. So basically what we're doing here is doing that. And we, we, we preach here, hopefully, the orthodox Christian faith. You know, the things that we just spoke about, the things that we profess in the creeds, which are all Christians who are orthodox, and that we also adhere by the moral law. The moral law, which comes to, that comes to us from the Jewish people. Now, we don't have to keep the ceremonial laws or the uh, liturgical laws or anything like that, but the moral law stands. So we preach that orthodoxy. We don't preach any other gospel. Rooted in the kerygma that the Apostle Peter preached. And th there we stand. We don't deviate from that because if I, if I was to deviate from that, I would pack my bags and retire straight away because it would be an abomination to God. Yes, we must listen to people. Yes, we must be kind. Yes, we must be loving. Yes, we must be understanding. Again, and not preacher people because they've got a problem. We've got to be kind. We've got to understand that could be me or it could be, you know, by the grace of God. How dare I just, you know, self-righteously start pronouncing things over people. No, not like that. But we have to be people who stick to what is right and respectfully stand on that. And what did they do? How did they live their life? Well, this is how they lived their life. Now, look, we can't live the way they lived exactly. They all lived in a small area in Jerusalem. We live 60 kilometres apart, most of us. But we do have clusters. We do have areas. And this is what they did. They remained faithful to the teaching of the apostles, which hopefully we give you here each Sunday, to the brotherhood or to the koinonia. Again, they couldn't wait to, to meet together. They were Every opportunity they had, they were together. Now, again, we can't do that most of the time because of distances. And, and many of us are faced with elderly parents and all sorts of issues that are beyond normal control. 
We're not speaking about those issues, but I'm just talking about generally speaking, okay? When we haven't got extraordinary things which come our way every so often and we've got to drop everything in order to attend to them. We're talking about the normal situation. There's always the exception to the rule. They wanted to be in Koinonia. That's what they, and they broke bread together, which we do in our, still in our churches, and to prayers, which we're pretty good at, actually. Most people here are pretty good at praying. In fact, um, um, I think we do very well here with the prayer that goes on. And that's, that's the thing that's, you know, we might be a bit deficient on some of the other things, but we've really, the fact that all this is still here is because people pray here. People pray. Many of you have spent many hours on your knees and many have gone to the Lord. There were some very, 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 very good people like Pat Wells and Maura Lee and many others who spent hours on their knees, many hours, and many, many others. I could name 50 people. And because they prayed, we're here today. So that's, that's what they were faithful to. This is, this is the blueprint. I didn't make this up. It's here in the book. And then many miracles and signs and wonders for the apostles made a deep impression of everyone. Now, we want to see these things happen again, and we... Uh, we had a team yesterday at the Catholic Charismatic Renewal and they went and they prayed for healing for many people and I believe it was, a, it was a wonderful day. There was about 80 people there touched and I'm sure many were healed, many, many were healed because a team representing us went out and they, they preached the gospel. They prayed with the sick. Isn't that right, Chris? Absolutely. So that, that's the things, they're the things that we've got to continue to do. So what happened here, and we've got Damien Stain coming. There's a great opportunity to see signs and wonders, to be part of signs and wonders. They'll happen, I'm assuring you, they will. There'll be people healed of all sorts of things. And maybe we'll see the odd miracle as well. It's up to us. In one sense, we need to pray. We need to be enthusiastic about these things. The faithful all lived together and owned everything in common. They sold their goods and possessions and shared the proceeds among themselves according to what each one needed. Now, uh, we don't do that and that's not, that's not a command, but that's what the Holy Spirit brought them to do. But what we do do here is that in our common life, and again, common life doesn't happen here on Sunday. It happens in the clusters. It happens in the small groups. That's where needs need to be met, not here. Not through the, not through the wider community so much, but that's where they get met, in those small groups, in that situation. And... No one should be any need, any spiritual, physical or material need. The faithful all lived together and owned everything in common. They sold their goods and possession and shared out their proceeds among those according to what each one needed. They went to the body as a, they went as a body to the temple every day, but met in their homes, houses for the breaking of bread. They shared their food gladly and generously. They praised God and were looked up to by everyone. Day by day, the Lord added to their community those destined to be saved. And in chapter 4, the reading we had this morning, there's another very important point. In verse 32 of chapter 4, it says, The whole group of believers was united in heart and soul. They were of one mind, in other words. They had the same call the same vision and, I'm, and and again we have to lay our own visions aside in order that we come into a unity of heart and mind and once once we start to do that we start to see the miracles again because there's unity in our prayer 
if we are scattered without, not in one mind, I think this and I want that and he should have done that and she should have gone there and he, she should, he should have been preaching and we start to get like that, then things will fall down. One mind, one heart, which was very much uh, explained very well this morning and, one, uh, uh, and something that was very, very strongly pushed. Okay. So what, sh what did the people say? What shall we do then? Well, we need to repent. That's what it says. That's what the people had to do. Now, again, I'm not, you know, most of us are doing the best we can. We've got a pretty good, pretty good uh, congregation here, a great bunch of people. But it's important that we don't lose sight of the purpose that we're here for. It's not just going to church on Sunday. That's good. But there's a purpose in all this. The purpose is clearly, clearly clarified in these first chapters of Acts. Just read it for yourself. Read it. Read the first three, four, five chapters. Clearly, it's clearly placed and stated here. There's no, um, you know. Now I know that uh, uh, you, we have to understand that culturally we live in a very different world. But our attitude has to be, particularly in worship and in fellowship, that of biblical proportions. We have to be prepared to worship God at every possible opportunity and we have to be in fellowship at every possible opportunity and we have to in that we have to see each other's needs and that means that we have to not only uh, uh, we have to also see others needs it's not only my needs fellowship doesn't work only if I come to you and I just want my needs met I have to be outward looking to see your needs. And that's what true fellowship's about. What am I contributing to the building up of this body? How do I serve? How do I um, uh, uh, treat people? So forth. How do I give? As well as how I receive. It's two ways. Fellowship isn't one way street. 